This is the Ernie Stadbeck Show with your host, Ernie Stadbeck. To get in touch with Ernie, write to Ernie Stadbeck, 378 South Van Buren Avenue, Barberton, Ohio, 44203-4014. By phone at 330-644-7724 or online at erniestad at aol.com. Now, here's Ernie with today's program. Welcome to our show. We're at MAPS Air Museum, Military Air Preservation Society, where history takes flight. And today we're not going to take flight, but I've got a compadre here, Jim Mesco. I got it right this time, yeah, Jim. Yeah, Ernie, you got it right this time. And I said a handsome guy, and he looked around to see who I was talking about. Uh, Jim, uh, we're standing, he also writes for the Suburbanite, writes a lot for the Suburbanite. In fact, this is his article. They posted it here. So now you're famous. You'll be doubly famous after this show, Jim. Well, Ernie, I hope so, but I don't know if it'll get my pay increased at all or not. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Jim is also an author. He's a retired school teacher here in the Green System, and he's written something like 45 books for the Worldwide and Famous Squadron Signal Series. And you also, uh, not only airplanes, but tanks and military uh, hardware and equipment and all that. Yep. What are some of the books? What are your favorite what books? Well, my favorite airplane is the A-26. Uh, so I've done three books on that. Uh, a lot of stuff based on my Vietnam experiences, uh, armor, infantry in Vietnam. I was in the Navy in Vietnam on, as an advisor. We did stuff on the Navy Riverine Forces. Um, just a little bit of everything, most, mostly World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So You're a Navy guy? Yep. And I invited a Navy guy onto an Air Corps and uh, Air Force show. Ernie, remember, I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> Not remember much. Remember Which way? Lesson. This way. <laughs> well, <laughs> probably. <laughs> okay. And before we really get started here, I'd like to have another gentleman who has in, uh, so graciously invited us down, made it possible for us to come down, uh, Bob Schwartz. I got that right, right, Bob? Yes, you and did. Oh. Welcome to MAPS. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, what is your title now? I'm uh, Chairman, Board of Directors, MAPS Air Museum. So we got the right guy, right? You got the right guy. Okay, well, thanks a lot for being with us. And uh, we're going to be down here again. Oh. You get something and anything you have coming up, we'll try to get down and do the show. Okay, that would be great. And thank you for coming. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, now the star of our show is not going to be you, Jim. It's not going to be me. It's going to be this Beast, <laughs> the bent wing bird, what, what did the uh, Japanese call it? Whistling death. Okay, now, Jim, you're the expert on some of these airplanes. Me being Air Corps and Air Force, uh, we know a little bit about these. We, I saw them in the fading days of World War II and also in Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell us about this machine? Okay, well, this is an F-4U. You want to take this? Okay. Okay. This is an F4U-5 NL Corsair. It's produced by Vought. Uh, saw service during World War II in Korea. Uh, was used by the French Indochina, plus a host of other small nations. Interestingly enough, the last World War II aircraft that was shot down was shot down by this plane in one of the uh, banana wars they had down in Central America. And a Corsair shot down a P-51. Now, the Corsair was very unusual for its time. What happened was they tried to, or they wanted to mate the largest engine at the time, the R-2800 by Pratt & Whitney, with the largest propeller to produce a fighter that could uh, basically outfly anything up in the air at the time. Well, to do that, they had the largest prop, which was a 13-foot Hamilton standard propeller. That big a prop would have made it very difficult for it to have ground clearance. So Vought, and you can see right in here, came up with the idea of using what they call the inverted gull wing. This allowed them to have a relatively short landing gear. It uh, kept the plane relatively close to the ground for servicing, but it also allowed the propeller to clear and not have to worry about it hitting you know, the decks on a carrier or the ground when it landed. So this was a very 
unique design during World War II. Uh, the plane actually was flying before Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was the first U.S. aircraft to fly level at over 400 miles an hour. So this was a phenomenal design considering the time frame, 19, the 1940s, very early in the time frame. Uh, it evolved through a whole series from the uh, first F-4U Corsairs, which were not really qualified for carrier landings because of the, the, the long nose here and the way the pilots would have to uh, have a hard time seeing the, the, the landing pattern. And Ernie, now you've had some experience with that. Do you want to comment on how these things uh, were landing? Okay, there was a great uh, uh, show on the History Channel, the Military Channel, rather, about the Corsair right from the beginning and the problems they had. The Navy wanted to make this a carrier-based fighter, but uh, they lost a, a lot of pilots because they could not see that carrier deck and could not see the landing signal officer. And so they had one accident after another. So the Navy then said, no more carrier landings for this airplane. So they sent a group over to uh, Bougainville and Guadalcanal, and the Boeington was in that group. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to, when the Brit British, the British pilots, perfected a way of landing on carriers. So they didn't lose any airplanes, but their landing, which you started to show us, Jim, was to come in. The regular carrier approach was like this for the Navy, and the big nose, went up, and these guys, the uh, carrier pilots, would completely lose sight of the deck in one accident after another. So the British found out how to land the Corsair. They would come in and keep in a turn, a slow, wide turn, so they could keep the deck in sight at all times and slip the airplane and drop it. So they taught the Navy pilots how to do it. So the Navy brought this group back that had scored a number of victories and started training them on carriers. They killed seven pilots before they got it right. But that was a tremendous show. Uh, Jim, could you hold this uh, right here? Okay. There, there's a beautiful picture of this beautiful airplane. And you mentioned the speed of what, 400 and some miles an hour? First US fighter could do level speed at 400 miles an hour. Well, for years, Cook Cleland's airplane, now, he, he was a commander in the Navy, yep. and Cook Cleland had a modified Corsair. He took four or five feet off each wing. They put a huge engine into the thing, the R4360, a bigger prop, and he did 501 miles an hour on about 99 miles away from Mach 1, jet speeds. And I think that record is still held today. I don't know about that, but that's, that was quite a record at the time. Okay, can you tell us about Speed Wilson now? Well, Speed Wilson is a Green resident. He was a Marine Corps pilot in World War II in Korea. Uh, had two kills, flying Corsairs out of the Solomons. Uh, after the war, he came back, uh, got in the reserves, and was activated uh, to fly in Korea. Flew in Korea in the Tiger Cat, was shot down while patrolling along the Yalu River, managed to make it back to uh, Wonsan Harbor, bailed out, and then spent the rest of the Korean War uh, working with the uh, Marine Liaison Group, flying TBFs up into the Marine Ford areas. After that, he flew out of uh, Akron Canton, and then flew, uh, then he wasn't flying, but he was in Vietnam with the, I think, 1st Marine Air Wing. Unfortunately, Speed just recently had a heart attack, and he's recuperating, so we sent him our best. Uh, we weren't, Ernie wanted to get him on the show today, but with him being in his health condition, he wasn't able to make it, so. Yeah. Uh, Jim, we had a show, we did a show with uh, Colonel, he's a retired yeah. Marine, full Marine, uh, full Colonel fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was an amazing man. And uh, as I mentioned, we did a show on him a couple of years ago. And he brought uh, models of the airplanes yeah. that he flew and he told that story about being shot down in the Tiger Cat. Mm -hmm. And he said they're flying along, and he napalmed a ridge. Yeah. And he said later, they said he'd killed something like 2,000 enemy <laughs> on that ridge. But the weather was so bad that he had to let down through the fog. And then his rear seat gunner on the Tiger Cat, on the night fighters, they put a rear seat in, took yep. out a, something like a 100-gallon fuel tank, 
and the sergeant back, this old colonel, he says, uh, I think you better ran, land pretty quick. He says, well, why? Well, my right arm just got shot off. <laughs> this is a Marine. And he had uh, taken gr some wires out and made a tourniquet, and he did survive. Yeah. Yeah, they told him on that mission there was no ground fire. There was no any aircraft sites around there, and he he proved him wrong on that one. <laughs> I don't now, think he wanted to, but <laughs> that's a hard way of doing it. Okay, can you tell us about uh, what actually model is this? Okay, this is the Dash 5 NL, and N stands for night fighter. L was one that was configured specifically for the winter conditions in Korea. And what they did, because in Korea uh, it was really cold in the wintertime, they, and you can see right here behind Ernie, uh, there is a heating element in the wing to stop it from icing. And they also had the uh, canopy had a, weeding, a heating unit in it so that it wouldn't fog over. And that was the basic difference between the just a straight night fighter and the one that was winterized. The other thing that was interesting about this, and if we come over here, you can see this is unique to the uh, this series of Corsairs, is the chin scoops on the side for the air intake. Uh, the earlier Corsairs only had one scoop. This has two scoops on the side. You can see them on right above either side of the props up there. And this was a hallmark of this the Dash 5, then the Dash 7, which was used basically by the French in Vietnam and Indochina, and then also the AU-1, Corsair, which was the uh, dedicated attack or ground attack aircraft that the Marines used. Uh, if you look around this, and as we walk over here, you can see, and I don't want to go too fast for Ray there, but being a night fighter, you just didn't fly up in the dark and look for enemy aircraft. You had to have a radar unit, and this is the ANAAPS-19 radar unit. Uh, this was developed latter part of World War II, and the pilot, now there was, you got to remember, there's only one pilot in the plane. So he is not only flying, but he's also having to watch his radar scope. Uh, we mentioned the Tiger Cat, Ernie and I were talking about, and that had a pilot and then a radar operator in the back, so that made it a little easier. In the Corsair, there was only one pilot, no radar operator, so he had to do everything. The only Navy ace in the Korean War, Guy Bordelon, flew a Dash 5 Corsair out of uh, Seoul, Korea, or Kimpo, and shot down five enemy nocturnal invaders that would fly in at night, and they'd try to keep the UN troops uh, awake by just throwing out hand grenades or small bombs. And he shot down five of those to become the only Navy ace of, World War of the Korean War. Basically, you had here, and we'll, uh, if you want to, we can later on go look at a similar unit. This was uh, rather large and bulky because it used vacuum tubes. Now, for our younger readers, vacuum tubes don't exist anymore. You know, we don't use them. But back then, that was, this was state of the art. And this could actually you be used for locating enemy aircraft, for long-range navigation. Uh, it could be put on uh, automatic mode. So this was, for its time, very, very sophisticated. And it gave the Corsair... Uh, capability that uh, a lot of them would operate at night. A lot of times they were not necessarily used to go after enemy aircraft. They would fly nocturnal missions against ground troops. Uh, radar would help them with that. Uh, they would carry, they could carry rockets and bombs and napalms. And then here you see the two 20 millimeter cannons, which were the hallmark of the Dash 5. Earlier Corsairs used 50 caliber machine guns. They used six of them, three in each wing. Uh, later Corsair models started using the 20 millimeters. These have the flash finders on them so that when they fired, the blast from the cannon shell would not blind the pilot. A couple of other things, if you look up here, and I don't know, if you, Ray, if you can get that up there. The Right behind the cowling, you can see there is like a flat protrusion coming out of the side of the fuselage, right up there behind the exhaust. And that was also to help cut down uh, the glare from the exhaust and probably to help keep oil from uh, splattering back up into the cockpit. The R2800, as Ernie had as mentioned earlier to me, is one of the uh, dirtiest engines flying in the sense of dripping oil. Uh, when it came in last week, I was talking to the pilot, and the pilot... Uh, Tom McHugh has about 350 hours flying the 
Corsair, and about 350 hours flying the P-51. And I asked him, which one did he like better? Well, <laughs> he wouldn't say. The only comment he made was, the Corsair leaks a lot more oil. And if you look down at the bottom, they have oil drip pans underneath it. Now, this has been sitting here for two weeks. When it came in, there was no oil in those pans. So this is how much oil has just dripped out from just sitting here. It actually left a trail of oil as they pulled it in here. And you could have seen at the time, right along the whole fuselage, all the way back from the exhausts, back to behind the canopy, was covered with a streak of oil. So this is a very uh, dirty running engine in the sense of, of being uh, dripping oil. But this engine, they made over 125,000 of these things. They are still flying today. A lot of them are in warbirds like this, but there are some that are still flying on operational aircraft. Uh, it's an 18-cylinder engine, and they have a cutaway model here. But this aircraft engine was one of the premier engines of World War II. It was used to power the Corsair, the Hellcat, the Tiger Cat, the Bearcat, the uh, P-47, the B-26 Marauder, the A-26 Invader, uh, all aircraft that have, you know, a tremendous war record. And a lot of airliners. Yes. Yes. Uh, 340s, 440s. Yeah, it just... Bears, DC-6s. Yeah, and the idea, this engine was a very reliable engine. That's why it stayed so long in mm -hmm. service was because it not only was a good engine in terms of power, mm -hmm. it was very reliable. Do you know something about... Corsair II. Yes. You're an expert on that. Okay, we're going to go. Know there's, there's no uh, I'm calling you an expert now. By golly, <laughs> you Navy guys, you're you're a wealth of information here. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to go over to another airplane now, and Jim's going to take over again. Can we get this off? Yeah. Just okay. Well, we're here at what we can characterize as Corsair Corner. And this quarter is dedicated to the FG-1, made right here. I think some of it was made right here in this hangar. And uh, you see the model there of uh, Matt, Captain Matt Miller, a Marine pilot. Models here, memorabilia here. And then we're at the FG-1 cockpit, Jim. Um, and once again, I'm going to turn it over to the expert. Okay, what we have here is, uh, as Ernie said, the FG-1 was the... Goodyear version of the Corsair, which was manufactured here. Actually, Goodyear, Vought, and Brewster manufactured Corsairs. This is, if you look where Ernie's, right behind where Ernie's standing, this is one of the later hoods. This is what was called the blown hood. This gave them pretty good visibility. The early hoods were uh, basically framed and cut down the visibility, but this gave them more headroom, gave them more visibility. There really wasn't a lot of difference between the FG versions and the F4Us that were manufactured by Vought. Uh, in fact, over now, the official number is 4,006 were manufactured by Goodyear. Now, Ernie, you and I talked about this the other day, and I'll let you comment on what you think the numbers are. Okay, I've always heard 5,600 and that they prided themselves on putting out one Corsair every eight minutes. And the number of guys I knew have passed on to the great <laughs> airport in the sky, guy by the name of uh, Joe Ross. He was a uh, test pilot here. And there was a number of guys, well, Bud Side, who used to be the chief pilot at Goodyear, was a test pilot on the FG-1. And I had a little problem with a Corsair. Now, I'm not going to blame it on you Navy guys. When the, <laughs> when the Corsair, when the Navy had the base here, the uh, reserve base here at Akron Muni Airport, I was flying one day, landed on 25, the southwest runway. And one of the Navy guys coming in on the Corsair was cleared to land, but he cut his pattern real short and he used this carrier type approach, way up like this so his nose hid me. I was on the runway after landing, and he landed, and then the tower starts screaming, get off the runway right now. I, he, I turned into the grass, and this guy went right by me. Well, you know, Ernie, when you think about it, a plane every eight minutes, that is phenomenal. I mean, that's back when American manufacturing was a force we reckoned with. 
Uh, now, the interesting thing about the Corsair was, as Ernie mentioned, uh, there was a unit based here at the old uh, Naval Air Station Akron. And during the Korean War, the Corsair unit here, VF-653, who was commanded by Cookie Cleland, the air racer, uh, they were called up. Now, there are some people that say that Cleland actually volunteered the unit and, and used all of his power to get the, the unit assigned to the Korean War. Uh, whether or not that is true, uh, there's differing views on that. But that unit did go to Korea. They were one of the first reserve units that was called up for the Korean War. And they lost six pilots, which is a, a pretty hefty loss since considering that I think there are only 24 units. So that's, uh, you know, a 25% loss ratio. Uh, so the Corsair, uh, as Ernie mentioned, it originally was not able to fly off the carriers. When the kamikaze threat came on into being in the late 1944, early 1945, they had to start putting more fighters on the carriers, and uh, they, they, they suffered a lot of losses, especially to Marine-based Corsair units uh, who were not really that well qualified for carrier approaches until they finally, you know, got the training that they needed to acclimate them to landing on the Corsairs or landing on the carriers. Uh, after the war, and one of the interesting things is the Hellcat, the F-6F, was the premier uh, Navy fighter of World War II. It uh, shot down, I think, 19,000 Japanese aircraft. After the war, the Corsair was picked because they felt it was more versatile to become the catch-all Navy aircraft on the carriers. It was used as a fighter aircraft, the night fighter like we saw over there, ground support, and it soldiered on into the Korean War uh, in a very active role. Uh, I, I think over 300 were lost in the Korean War itself. Uh, whereas the Hellcat was relegated to training and for drone control. So this uh, is one of the premier aircraft that the United States produced and uh, a tremendous you know, aviation record. Uh, we won't see the likes of this again, plane again, except, and we'll go there next, right. the son of Corsair. Okay, I was just going to say, <laughs> Jim, you love this Corsair, but we have to move on yeah. <laughs> to the son of Corsair. One other thing, remember the movie, The Bridges of Tokori? Yep. Okay, that involved Corsairs. Corsairs and A1s and, and Panthers and Hellcats, not Hellcats, uh, Banshees. They used about everything. That's a right. great war flick. Yeah, and Mickey Rooney was in that yep. movie. Okay, we're going to go over now to what? Corsair? Corsair 2. Two, the son of Corsair 1. Yeah. I had to literally drag Jim away from the Corsairs. I think that's his favorite machine. Now, Jim, tell us where we are. Well, Ernie, you can't keep a good plane down, and the original Corsair obviously is relegated to the past. What we have behind us is another Vought design, but th by this time Vought has now Chance Vought, and this is the A7 Corsair II. This, as was we kind of jokingly said, the son of the Corsair. This was a subsonic ground support aircraft that came into being during the Vietnam War. Now, Ernie, you're going to like this. Now, this is obviously a Navy airplane, but it was such a good airplane that the Air Force adopted it. So the Air Force adopted it. It was used in Vietnam by both the Navy and the Air Force. The Marines never took this under their wing. They never flew this. But the Air Force took it on. The National Guard took it on. The Ohio Air National Guard had a unit out of Springfield and Toledo that flew it. And there was a two-seat version of it, both the Navy and the Air Force. And it's still flying. The Greeks are still flying it, and they're using it to train pilots uh, who are converting over to F-16s and new pilots. So in a sense, this sub super, uh, came after the Corsair. Uh, it's still in existence. It's still flying. It's been retired from U.S. service, but it carries on the lineage that the Corsair actually started in World War II. So we have here, as you said, the son of Corsair and uh, its training pilots who would be considered probably the great-grandchildren of the pilots who flew the Corsair in World War II. I see here, this was a subsonic airplane, yep. meaning what? Can you explain? Uh, subsonic is it would not be able to fly at the speed of sound. And so it was uh, basically a ground support aircraft, and it replaced the A-4 uh, Skyhawk, which was built by Douglas. That was one of the reasons that the Marines didn't want this, is because they were very happy with the A-4, which did a superb job. And so they said, well, with budget constraints and stuff, we'll keep flying the A-4, and they updated that. So this never saw Marine Corps service. 
but it still was a mainstay of the U.S. Navy. It flew in Vietnam. It flew in the various conflicts up through Desert Storm. So this is a long-serving aircraft. Jim, you know, down at Davis Monathan Air Force Base, down at the, they call it the Boneyard, there's over 400 A-4s. At least there was two years ago, and they're selling them to third world countries. And the Navy bought them for something like 300,000 apiece years ago. And they're selling them for something like, no, for a million dollars. Million dollars, I got my figures wrong. And they're selling them to foreign countries for $20 million plus parts. Yeah. Now that boneyard is the only government agency that returns a profit to the government. Wait, Ernie, don't let that get known because if it gets known, the government will change it and we'll probably start losing money on it. <laughs> but, so this is it. This is the Corsair from we have over there. Are we gonna go back to the other one? I mean, we, can we go back to the other one, Ernie? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, because that's my favorite airplane. Okay, let's <laughs> show the let's show the engine. Okay. You tell us about the engine. We're looking at a cutaway of the R twenty eight hundred two thousand horsepower engine, and once again, I'm going to turn to our expert, Jim. He's never word expert too much, Ernie. Uh, this is, as Ernie said, a cutaway of the R twenty eight hundred. Like I said earlier. They build over 125,000 of these, air, uh, these aircraft engines. Uh, dual or twin cylinder, twin rows of cylinders. You can see here how complex it is between the gears and, and all the, the fittings here. This was an extremely complex engine for its time, yet it was a very reliable engine, a very powerful engine. And I won't go on to say that this aircraft engine won World War II, but it sure made it a lot easier for us to come out victorious. And when you think of the engines, or the aircraft this uh, engine powered, like the Corsair, the Hellcat, the P-47, uh, the in, in, uh, Marauder, the Invader, uh, plus the civilian aircraft that it did uh, power, this is an awesome engine. And again, like I said, over 125,000 of these were made. Some are still in use in the Warbird circuit, and there are some that are still flying uh, on operational aircraft. So this is just, for its time, was a magnificent piece of machinery. Uh, and it showed what America can do. American manufacturers, when they're really challenged, uh, can come up with. And when you think of something that's you know, it's been in service 60 or 70 years, that's pretty good. I mean, you're getting your, you're getting your money's worth out of this engine. And the U.S. taxpayers got their money's worth out of this engine. Uh, so this is the type of exhibit, but if you ever come out to MAPS, you're going to get a chance to see. I mean, you don't get to go in every museum and see stuff like this, but if you're ever interested in aviation, this is a place to come. Jim, the big brother to this is the R4360. Do you remember the horsepower on that? That was in the DC-7, the yes. C-119. and 4,000? Uh, it, yeah, uh, it was up there. Yeah. A huge. Uh, they got one down at right field, a cutaway, 25,000 moving parts in it. And it's amazing when you look at how tough this metal has to be and how yeah. uh, close tolerance is. It's amazing. Now, if we have another war, we're going to have to send all this stuff over to a foreign country. Okay, uh, well, thanks a lot for being with us, Jim, the expert. By golly. Hey, Ernie, it's always help, nice to help you Air Force guys out. Oh, gee, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I let myself in for that one. <laughs> you did, Ernie. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for being with us, folks. And if you have a chance, come down July 3rd for the 20th anniversary here at MAPS. This has been the Ernie Stadbeck Show with your host, Ernie Stadbeck. To get in touch with Ernie, write to Ernie Stadbeck, 378 South Van Buren Avenue, Barberton, Ohio, 44203-4014. By phone at 330-644-7724 or online at ErnieStad at AOL.com.